Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this our webinar that we are doing in partnership with the Pittsburgh Technology Council. And we are fortunate to have brought back Ashley D. Bell, uh, who is the White House advisor for the SBA Regional Administrator on our discussion on updating us, um, the African American Chamber, as well as the Pittsburgh Technology Council on what is happening around the stimulus programs. We uh, will be taking questions and we wanna move forward as quickly as we can. So let me introduce briefly if I can, uh, and I hope you don't mind, Ashley. We're just very pleased to have you come back. Um, yeah. Ashley is also the Entrepreneurship Policy Advisor for the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council. He's a seasoned entrepreneur, having started his own business at the age of 22 when he was in college. He's an attorney by trade, and he brings an enthusiasm and commitment to his work at SBA and the White House out of a personal understanding of the challenges and successes of small business ownerships. Uh, as I mentioned before, and I'd love to tell everyone, he's been recognized as a top 40 young lawyer by the American Bar Association. He was a 21st century leadership fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and holds an honorary doctorate from what Lighthouse College. Ashley will update us and discuss the details of what's happening with the stimulus program. If you have questions, I'm pleased to say Brian Kennedy will just go right in and introduce you with your questions, but welcome back, Ashley. Thank you so much for that, that introduction. It's good to be back with you. Thank you so much to the uh, Chamber of Commerce there in West Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh. I, I think that this is a, uh, just a fantastic opportunity to speak directly to entrepreneurs and people that need to have good information about these programs. Uh, your partnership uh, with the Technology Center, I think is important because there's so much around technology innovation that's at stake here. Um, entrepreneurs are the backbone of our community and minority entrepreneurship, as you know, is a challenge even in good times. Uh, when times are good, the majority, 57% of African-American entrepreneurs particularly have zero to 10 days of working capital. So every day is precious at this very moment. We have to make sure we make every day count. And coming on webinars like this are important because we're making today count. And that's what we can't control. What we can't control is what we do today. What we can't control is the information that we accept into our business plans, our plans for our future and our businesses, and what we share with others. And hopefully the spirit of the chamber is found in each and every one of you of sharing an uplifting message of togetherness and, and, and a shared destiny that we all know that if we save one business, we're doing more than saving one business. We're saving jobs. We're saving someone's dream. But today, if we can save more than one, if we can spread the message to everyone in Pittsburgh that needs to hear this, uh, then I think we will turn the corner to seeing the light at the end of this tunnel where we know that on the other side is a new path. And a new path is what we're all fighting for. We don't want to end this and go back down the same path we've always gone down. That's right. This is an opportunity, a fresh start, if you would. And let's talk about what that means. What we've seen with the PPP program is that round one went very quickly because the businesses that were well healed, that were ready and able, that had the infrastructure, the knowledge, the expertise, took very quick advantage of PPP one, and they were in and out of the system in a flash and the money was gone just as quick. Here we are with PPP2, and we've been in it almost the same amount of time that PP1 existed, and we still have, to the good news of everyone who's listening today, about half of the money is still there. And the question is, wh how, why, is it, why is the money not going as fast as, as it did the first time? Well, the reality is that the people who needed the money and also had the resources to go get the money got it. And so now we're at a situation where we still have a tremendous amount of minority owned businesses that have not taken advantage of the program for a couple of reasons. One in particular is the fact that 90% of all African-American businesses do not have employees. And so when someone says, 
there's a payroll protection program and you're a Schedule C person or you're an independent contractor, it doesn't really ring a bell to you as something that's for you, but it is. And so because of that, we've seen a slowing of the amount of applications that are coming uh, that, are, that are being processed. But the reality is now who's left are the people that need the African-American Chamber of Commerce. The people that are left are the people that need the te technical assistance from a small business development center. The people that are left is everybody else who needs the, uh, these resources but need help crossing that hurdle, closing that gap. And that's what I hope we can talk a little bit about today because it's important to understand what that means. And so if you're an independent contractor, sole proprietor, um, this program is definitely for you. If you'll be treated just like a normal business. So people say, well, how does that work? I don't take out taxes on myself. I just, I, I, I make money and I spend what I have to to stay in business and what's left is my earnings. Well, that's fine. That's exactly what, what you should be doing. And we'll, we'll talk about a, a larger conversation that we need to have after that. What one really important thing that the president of Liberty Bank brought up to me uh, on a call I had just not too long ago, a couple of days ago, uh, Liberty Bank's one of the older African-American uh, banks, owned banks in the country, uh, based out of New Orleans. And what's important, what, 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 what President uh, uh, McDonald told me, he said, you know, what we're realizing is that many times with sole proprietors and Schedule Cs, we're trained to show less profit because we don't want to pay taxes. So we, so we spend a lot sh and, and show very little. And so now that's coming to haunt many of our, our African-American businesses because how this process works is that your Schedule C uh, on that line that shows your net income. So you're going to show your gross, then everything you deduct, and then what your net is. Let's just say it's $50,000. Well, this program is just going to chop up that 15 to 12, and that's your monthly income. And then that is the average by which your payroll protection plan uh, will be calculated. And I think that's important to know. But the reality is that what, what Mr. McDonald talked about is that as we go through this, um, let's not just get through it to get through it. Let's get through it to learn from it. And how do we learn from it? And he, he was showing me statistics of where he said that, you know, many other communities, he said, especially with white entrepreneurs, uh, with their profits, they don't write off everything to show no profits. They keep their profits and they just shelter their profits from taxation instead of not showing it so they don't get taxed. And that is, he said, is the greatest indicator of the large wealth gap uh, that separates uh, many of our communities. And so when we think about this, let's first tackle where we are. Now, where we are is right now, your Schedule C or your 1099s that you put towards your taxes for 2019 and 2018 are what we have to start with. So you divide that by 12, and that's going to get you the number that you need. So the key here is now, it's like, where do you go? And let's talk about the narrative that's out there that minority entrepreneurs aren't getting access to these funds. Let's speak about the truth about this. Yes, getting access to capital has always been a challenge, even for my businesses that I started at a young age. Going to a bank um, for African-American entrepreneurs has always been a challenge. And historically, it has come... Uh, you know, with many hurdles and many setbacks. Uh, and there's been many lawsuits from civil rights acts and predatory lending uh, lawsuits that have highlighted and uh, painted a very broad picture of, of where we have been and sort of reflect where we are now. So what I mean by that is that many African-American entrepreneurs applied to a bank, didn't hear back the first round until the money was gone. And then they applied to a, another bank in round two, and those larger banks many times did not get back to them. And so what we've seen is that the focus and the successes that we've seen in African-American community by and large have come from the ability of minority-owned banks stepping up and extending their liquidity to the marketplace in unprecedented fashion. CDFIs joining uh, with SBA's authorization, joining to become um, PPP lenders, which are community development financial institutions credit unions being allowed to not have to compete with larger banks for this program. And what does that mean? The administration was very clear. The second round, in order to make sure money was able to reach deep into our communities, what we did different, different the second round is to separate the money from large banks and smaller banks. So small banks had their own pot of money separated from the larger banks because what happened last time is everybody who was picked by the large banks to participate 
with their two and three and four and five million dollar loans came in right off the top, took it and, and, and were gone. When the smaller banks were trying to get into the system for the smaller loans, and we've seen that this is working. We had the average, the average loan for PPP one was six figures. Um, the, the average loan this time around is under $80,000 and it's shrinking because so many of our loans now, 50% of them are coming from small to medium sized banks and that's important. So for everybody who either filled out an application and I was just on a call uh, last week with Sean Combs and his organization, Our Fair Share, which if you haven't seen it, please check it out because Our Fair Share is a very noble effort by Sean Combs to um, link a lot of the minority banks together in an effort to have a portal for any minority entrepreneur to go to to apply for the PPP loan and they sort of match you with a minority owned bank um, that is willing to service your application and they specialize in independent contractors, sole proprietors and faith based organizations and nonprofits. So that's, that, that's been a big lift. But one of the challenges that he saw, which I wrote a letter to today to some of his applicants was we just had a call and hit 4,000 people uh, go to the website and try to apply after we had our, our massive call the other day. But out of those, those 4,000 people did not complete their application. They started, didn't have the right paperwork, didn't have the right infrastructure to be able to quickly exercise this opportunity. And that's what we've historically seen is that the challenge has never been, can our businesses perform as good as my service as everybody else? Because we can and many times do it better than most. Does also mean that we we give incredible uh, service, incredible goods, but the issue has always been the infrastructure. Many times, um, as a lawyer, I can tell you that built my own practice. As a retail uh, entrepreneur that built several retail stores, just because you're good at selling, just because you're good at being a lawyer, a baker, electrical engineer, a computer scientist, uh, information technology person. It does not mean that you're good at business. It means you can have a business and that business can, can operate itself. But what, we, what we're talking about here is a, is a larger conversation about the need to also have the technical expertise. And if you don't have it, go get somebody that has it to run your business. And this, this gap, this void is what's being highlighted right now in a major, major way. So what does this mean? This is a bigger telltale sign of, of what we're facing uh, as a community, uh, that sign is that all the work that we put into our business, all the work that all of us who have had a business and risk our time, talent, and treasure to achieve, want to make sure that our business survives. But not only survives, we've always talked about this was our avenue to create generational wealth. And there's a difference between owning a job and owning a business. Owning a job, means that you're paying your bills, you're doing everything you're supposed to do. But if you go, the job goes. You can't pass down a job to your kids, but you can pass down a business. And the only way we can do that is that we have the infrastructure in place or the capabilities to make sure that someone else can tell our story, that someone else at a bank who looks at our numbers, that our numbers should be able to tell our story of how hard you actually work, how smart you actually are how innovative you actually have been to prepare and be ready for this moment. And that moment is told on paper. So how do we get there? How do we get that technical assistance? It starts with a couple of things. Yes, there are great nonprofits out there. Your chamber is always the first place to look because they know, they know you, they know the community well, and always look to your chamber. Uh, we have great friends that have helped put together this called Tony Payton and others who have allowed uh, opportunities for many entrepreneurs to get that technical assistance, to know how to tell their story the right way to the people that can lend them credit, debt, and opportunities. And so now it's time to tell our story. Because if we don't, the story will be told that we lost a generation of entrepreneurs because of a virus. And we can't have that happen. So what must we do? We must find the technical assistance, either through your chamber or through your SBA, which has a Pittsburgh office that has a small business development center which your taxpayer dollars have been funding to make sure that they are offering you prepaid services to help you fill out your PPP application, to help you get your numbers together, your paperwork together to tell your story. We I have to tell you now. I'm sorry. So I offer you this opportunity to um, reach out, to make sure they know you're there, 
and to make sure you take advantage of this incredible opportunity we have before us. And I'll turn it back to the moderator for questions. Um, th thank you, Ashley. You've, you've hit on a number of topics that I know our members are interested in. We have an SBA office that we work with and they are under new leadership now. I think that some of the- Dr. Hunt, I think, right? Kelly Hunt is, their, is the district director up there, right? Yes. Uh, some of the people that are engaged with them should be meaningful for this discussion, but to move forward. Brian, you have some questions? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so yeah. if you have questions, please um, please type, type those in the chat section. Um, I, I do have um, at least one or two um, quick questions. Tomorrow, we're gonna be hosting um, the Federal Reserve, who's gonna come in and talk about the, um, the Main Street Lending Program. Can you talk about how that program is gonna interact with the PPP and the, um, the idle loans? Are there, if you've gotten a PPP loan, are you able to go after one of those Main Street Lending Programs? Is that, can, be, can it be used in combination? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'll, I'll save some of the thunder for my friends on the Fed for you to talk to tomorrow. But one of the key things the Fed is doing uh, that you may want to ask about is the fact that they're extending liquidity to our CDFIs. That to me, that has been the most critical element of supporting our PPP program that the Fed is doing. And the P, we have this uh, program, that obviously the PPPLF, the Payroll Protection Plan Liquidity Fund. Uh, some of the challenges facing our uh, CDFIs is that they don't have a lot of liquidity. They, they, they understand the community. They have a mission that is to serve those underserved communities. However, they don't have the cash and quantity to be able to get it into the community. And so the Fed is now offering them access to that cash through the payroll protection uh, liquidity fund. So I think that's a great topic also for you to bring up with the Fed uh, tomorrow, whenever you have your call to talk about which CDFIs locally are taking advantage of that fund. Uh, second question I had for you, you talked about the SBDCs, which um, do some pretty amazing work here in, in Western Pennsylvania. Have you seen any great examples um, nationally where they've helped people tack, right? Like just completely change the strategy of their business um, to take advantage of virtual and online technologies from restaurants to other types of businesses who really may not have that technical expertise to be able to to change quickly. Are the, the SPDCs doing a good job of that? Yeah, I, I think they are nationally. They're doing a fantastic job in Pennsylvania. They're doing a fantastic job. And, and some of the examples I've seen that to me are just, um, are just fantastic, or especially when you have people that uh, produce goods, especially consumable goods, uh, people that may have products that need to be placed in a Walmart or a grocery store it's really hard to invent something or create some food or some consumable and have this fantastic idea and get it to a mass marketplace. So you're not having to, you know, just sell it out of a, you know, a flea market or your car or whatever. SBDCs have taken some phenomenal products that we all know today uh, that have started with an idea and a dream that entrepreneurs have had and they help them understand how to market their product uh, and teach them the business of going into a grocery store. And I, you know, I followed around uh, one of our, our, our honey companies, uh, you know, not too long ago. And I said, look, you know, walk me through what this SBDC did for you. It's just a family that was, you know, making their own honey. And they said, look, you know, we want to get it in the marketplace. And we had to learn that a, a grocery store is just, it's about renting space. You have to find your space in a grocery store. You have to rent it. And they had to help us figure out how we're going to get the access to capital to rent this space and hopefully make sure that we're renting a space uh, that can get us the returns that we need in order to expand our marketplace. And now that's a $50 million company when it started off with a Peace Corps volunteer who was just returning home uh, from learning how to you know, grow bees in Jamaica and he came back and now he's got a $50 million business because our SBDCs helped him uh, turn that dream and that small skill that he learned while serving and volunteering overseas into a, a, a household name in that industry. So time and time again, our SBDCs are great for, the, for helping you understand your market and helping you expand your market by putting you in touch with people who have the expertise to know the entryways into larger marketplaces for your products and services. Okay. Um, I'm gonna bring on uh, Mr. Delbert Tyler to ask a question. And I think it's a really good question because we've heard this come up a few times. So uh, Mr. Tyler, do you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Sure. Uh, I was asking if you filed with a 
um, for the PPP with a large bank and you haven't heard anything, uh, would it be wise or can you then apply to a smaller bank um, to see if you can speed that process up? Right, and, and that's a great question. I appreciate you asking it because um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about that because I think that um, that exact circumstance is what's created a narrative that many minority business owners have not had access to this program. It is exactly that. Uh, these are businesses that have been very successful who applied with large banks who are waiting on a response, either didn't get it or got a response after the first round was over. And you're thinking now that maybe I'm still in the queue. They may have sent you an email and you don't know what to do, but you don't want to wait till money is over. Money is gone. So I encourage you that if, if you apply for the first round, your bank hasn't gotten back to you. Um, smaller banks have been the successful alternative for many of our entrepreneurs. Uh, credit unions have been successful alternatives. For many of our friends in the gig economy, FinTech has been a successful op uh, op option. I talked to uh, entrepreneurs today. I was on, you know, just talking to a few that were funded through PayPal. Um, you know, people who, whether you're in a beauty salon industry or otherwise, you're taking credit card payments from Square or Cabbage. All of those are PPP lenders now. And FinTech knows how to process a lot of data very quickly. So a lot of what I've seen are the FinTech options go very fast. And understand this, there's a 10 day rule on when you have to go from getting funded, approved to getting funded. So if you're ambiguous about whether or not your bank told you you're approved or whatnot, from the day that you think they told you were approved, if it's been 10 days and you don't have money in your account, then you are not approved. And I would suggest that you move on. now. If you move on and you have, you, as long as you use the same EIN, as long as you use the same social security or EIN number, um, it'll be a first come first serve basis. Meaning that if you go to a small bank and that small bank gets you funded, then if for whatever reason, a big bank comes around to you and says, hey, let's just go ahead and process this application. And they try, it won't allow them to. So you're safe to apply with a second bank. The key is use whatever the same number that you applied um, for the big bank as a little bank, be it your social security number, which some people do because they're sole proprietors or have 1099s, or your EIN, if that is suitable for your business. And um, we have a question here from Jarrell asking, if you were turned down in the first round, can you apply again uh, in, in a second round? It depends on why you were turned down. Um, you know, some people, you know, some people, may have been turned down for prohibited reasons. Uh, sometimes there, there are issues that you may have in your, in your history that may prohibit you from participating. Uh, some of those are, I mean, I've seen people with um, f large child support judgments. Um, I've seen people with, uh, you know, uh, just certain fraud issues may have been in the past, uh, not saying that's the case with this person, but there's a list of exclusions that are on the sba.gov website of if you hit one of those exclusions, then um, it's not gonna change whether or not you apply to a different bank or not. But if none of those exclusions apply to you, um, and let's just say your bank just didn't process your application and you weren't declined, you just weren't served and go somewhere else. But if you were declined, um, they, they have an obligation to tell you why you were declined and, and if that matches up. If that doesn't match up with one of those prohibited issues then you should apply again. Good. It looks like we have a, que a follow-up question here from from Delbert, do you wanna um, go ahead and ask that question, Delbert? Sure, sure. Um, it, it, after you've received the um, PPP, when does the accounting for it start? From the time that you receive it or from the time the crisis began? The eight weeks starts once you receive it. Okay, so it's going forward, got it. Yes. Not seeing any other questions right now. Um, I maybe we. I think um, we have a few more minutes. I wanted to ask you a question about the underground economy because a lot of us probably know people who are uh, would consider themselves part. Well, if they if they did, would consider themselves part of the gig economy, um, and uh, who are going to be for that reason locked out of most of these programs if they were um, didn't have formal businesses established. 
Um, is this a period of time where the SBA might be reaching out to folks like that and helping them to, to form businesses so they can understand it, have the impact it has on them for social security collections and unemployment and, and all of the different issues that so many thousands of people that are gig economy workers, um, you know, are now disadvantaged um, for unemployment reasons and, and small business loans and things like that. Yeah, well, yeah, I, yeah, I think so. I, I think that the gig economy workers are the primary customers of the fintechs right now. Um, the, gig economy, the gig economy workers are the ones who are being paid via Cash App, Zelle, Cabbage, PayPal. Um, and, and, and those folks don't have traditional banking relationships as one may consider one to be traditional. So they're allowed through these fintech options to take advantage of the program. And that's, they have been huge helps to serving our gig economy. Um, you know, and I, I think that, you know, if you, if you remember the gig economy, you want to look to whatever service that you use for your cash transactions, PayPal, the rest of them, all those companies have set up algorithms by which they help you calculate what your actual earnings are and they'll expedite your PPP loan and they'll do it very quickly. Thank you. Okay. We have a question here. Um, from Tanya Smith. Uh, Tanya, did you want to ask your question? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, so my question is that um, I am a life sustaining business. I've been open for four years. I was approved for the first round of the PPP. Here is my question, two part. Um, the new stimulus package, which was 484 billion, there was 25 billion set aside for testing. I have recently spent $20,000 for testing and $13,000 for PPE for my employees. Is that $33,000? Um, can it be reimbursed or is there some way that a small business can go about getting reimbursed for that? The second part of my question is there was $60 billion set aside for smaller financial institutions. Can you break that down? Is any of that set aside for um, SBA, like small businesses or minority-owned businesses? Uh, okay, thank you. The first question, I, I believe those funds were to go towards cities, I'm not cities, but states and grants uh, and other methodology to purchase uh, those protective equipment for frontline workers, not necessarily directly to small businesses, even though I think that conversation is catching a lot of steam and 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 future conversations about what that could mean for stimulus packages going forward. So stay tuned there. Secondly, uh, that was what you're speaking of is what I was talking about earlier was that this go around, we separated the funds, big banks from smaller banks and, and the $60 billion that you're speaking of was split between uh, 30 billion for banks with under a billion in assets, which would capture your credit unions, CDFIs, many of your you know, smaller bank, community banks, and then you had your mid-tier banks that are 10 billion to 1 billion, another 30 billion for them. So those are two different sets of money. So when you hear what was set aside for um, African-American business or minority-owned businesses, the set aside was to make sure that the primary vehicle by which small businesses were going to benefit was going to come from uh, smaller banks. And the rationale behind that is that 90% of minority businesses, African-American businesses don't have any employees. And so a lot of larger banks just weren't processing. Um, it wasn't cost beneficial for them to process an application that didn't have any employees on it. So smaller banks were doing that. They were taking up that work. So you isolated the ability of uh, large banks to take you know, money by taking off the top. And then you empower the smaller banks to be play a more critical role in that. And so what we did to make sure that the smaller banks were able to do that, um, last week uh, for a whole day, we shut down the system and only let, had a whole day where only small banks could process. And that allowed us to focus more on the CDFIs and that is what has increased the participation from those that, that come from those institutions. And we surpassed the $30 billion for small banks very quickly once we did that. And so now we're actually letting the small banks, the bucket of money for the small banks now is taking from what was left for the big banks. And so at this point, you know, which, which, which was originally supposed to be 30 billion 
just for under for small banks under one billion is already almost sixty billion for banks that have under uh, one billion in assets alone, not including mid tier banks. And so that just goes to show that we've seen a tremendous outpouring of support uh, by small banks and, our, and those small lenders under a billion dollars in assets. So there's two questions kind of related to that topic. Um, Jenny is asking, um, looks like um, she's applied to actually become a PPP lender and uh, wants to know how long it should take to hear back um, for that. And then the second question is, um, we'd heard you mention maybe a website where folks can go and get connected with some of those smaller lenders and someone asked that you repeat that. Right. So um, the first question, you want to reach out to your district office there, uh, Dr. Hunt, her team could definitely help you out uh, with tracking down where your application will be to become a PPP lender in the event that you qualify for that for that uh, uh, operation, then definitely we want to help you do that as quickly as possible. Uh, to, your, to your second question, what was the second question again? Uh, second question is, um, uh, Terry uh, wants to know, what, what's the website that you may have mentioned earlier oh, where you can right. find a small, small lender? So the, that website is, um, there's the several, right? So we're not endorsing one over the other, but the particular one I was mentioning was by Sean Combs, uh, who's a, a, a music artist. And uh, he, 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 along with some of the, the National Bankers Association, which is a coalition of black owned banks, uh, came together to form a, a coalition called Our Fair Share. And so ourfairshare.com uh, is where his, banks, network of banks reside, and we're definitely offering uh, technical support to anyone who applies there, as well as anywhere else. And then I believe Gina Winstead from our team also um, posted, which I'll repost, a link to find a CDFI institution um, in your community, which are playing so prominently in this discussion today. You know, I could, I would love to keep Ashley here for another hour, really, because this has been a good discussion, but it's qualitative in terms of sharing of information. I want to thank him for agreeing to have come back because we talked with him the first time. And um, it's nice for you to be able to share the kind of technical expertise you have, but give us a broader overview. I am pleased to hear that there are funds still available for small businesses. I think the goal has to be now for us and other regions, how to tap into that. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're here to help you with that. And what I, and, and, and I'll be in touch with you. We're, we're gonna have uh, some national calls. We love to have the chamber join up and help share some of those national calls that we're doing with influencers around the country to talk more about technical assistance. Uh, I think it could be an additional service, but I wanna thank you for your leadership. Um, this is definitely, you know, one of the most active influential chambers in the country, and I appreciate you for giving us the opportunity to share with you today. I want to thank you for agreeing to come back and join us today. I want to thank Brian Kennedy, one of our members with the Pittsburgh Technology Council, for being a partner with us. And thank all of those that are on the line, including our chairman, Sam Stevenson, who has uh, sat in, this is his second go round on learning more about what SBA has to offer and how we can access information. Thanks to everyone who has been a part of this webinar and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thanks everyone. Have a great night. You too.